the Altered Realities panel. Um, I'm Francesca Lynn, I'll be the moderator. I'm actually going to have, instead of um, me introducing and reading the bios, um, I, I was gonna ask you all to introduce yourselves mm -hmm. as we started it, because we've already talked about how maybe like, I don't know, sometimes I find these like a little bit like awkward and strange when I'm just reading the bio off of, and um, and instead, uh, I think the panel, I think everyone in the audience may maybe rather hear from you than from me, um, and so I have some general questions to start us off. But I'm hoping for our goal is to have more of a conversation amongst the panelists rather than me giving them quizzes about everything. So um, maybe we could start with. Um, furthest from the uh, from me, Laura. Yeah. Yeah. Go ahead, Hi. please. <laughs> so, hello everyone. Uh, I'm so happy to be here. Uh, first of all, I would like to thank uh, Spain Arts and Culture, uh, SPX, and Fantagraphics for having me here, because I'm I'm very happy to share with you all I can share about comic books. So, yeah. Who can I present myself? Um, I'm an illustrator and a comic artist based in Spain, in Valencia, there is a coastal city. So I have worked as an illustrator for the last, I guess, 10 years right now. Um, sorry. Um, well, I have worked as an illustrator for the Washington Post, well, a lot of clients like uh, National Geographic, Washington Post, Vogue, um, Wacom, Disney, Hulu, I don't know. I'm so tired of, of like too many, many clients, uh, mostly from the United States and a lot of from, from Spain. But, um, but, and I, sorry <laughs> for my English sometimes, uh, got some jet lag. Um, and also I was nominated for an Emmy uh, for my work on the credit design of only murders in the building. So yeah, it's a good experience like being an illustrator and telling stories that you never know what is gonna happen, like drawing. But well, um, <clears throat> one day I decided to, to tell my own stories because being an illustrator for a long time means that you have to, to do a lot of other stories, you know, because people is asking you to do uh, their own stories. So yeah, one day uh, I see it and I say, okay, I've been doing this like 10, ten years, um, but I have my own, my own, you know, like my own stories that I want to tell. So I started with a friend and we created uh, the first book that it now is available with a uh, dark horse that the name is uh, Naufragos. I think it's Castaways in English, I don't know. Um, then. It was the same thing. I was doing another personal story. So I was like, I want to create my own, my own stories. So I created Ocultos, that now is available with a Fantagraphics. And then I create Totem, that already has Fantagraphics too. So I'm so happy with this. And yes, I think uh, to define myself, uh, I like to to get involved, trying to explore the human psychology, mystery, um, the unusual, uh, the strength, the feelings, the fears. And comics has the ability to, to create different atmospheres that we all enjoy. So I think one of my best, uh, biggest satisfaction is to, to tell stories, to tell something with just a little words. I don't really like to write a lot of words in each comic. I prefer uh, that images um, tell the story by themselves. So I think that it's all. Um, yeah, uh, telling the stories, and that's the reason I'm here, because one day I decided to tell the stories and trying to find my own voice. So thank you so much. Thank you. <laughs> Uh, hey everybody, uh, I'm Nate Powell. I also make comics. Uh, I split my time pretty evenly between making fiction that is mostly kind of in the magical realism vein uh, and doing nonfiction comics. Um, <clears throat> and I 
in general, I feel like I'm better known for doing nonfiction, but uh, my weird fiction is definitely my home planet. So I'm actually very excited and honored to be able to be on a panel just to talk about the weird stuff. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, in general, I'd say all four of my solo graphic novels um, would fall to some degree uh, under the subject matter for this panel. And I've always, I feel like, even with my first like full-length book, uh, Swallow Me Whole, um, a lot of it, it was a blend of, of a very powerful dream that actually like jolted me awake and I began just scribbling down notes. Uh, and that sort of blended with a lot of my experiences, not only as like a, a professional, uh, you know, direct care worker and advocacy worker for people with disabilities and mental disorders, uh, but also my own family experience, just my older brother being a child of the 70s, long undiagnosed on the spectrum before the spectrum existed. Uh, and a lot of this just kind of blended together and uh, kind of hit like a, like a lightning bolt with Swallow Me Whole. And I was always kind of surprised that people well, that it was published, that someone else wanted to publish it, mm -hmm. but also uh, that people were responding very powerfully uh, to it. And it was my first time to kind of step outside of the weird vein of comics I, I had felt drawn to, to realize that uh, I needed to focus on, you know, like concreteness and clarity in my storytelling to keep the weird stuff even weirder. Mm -hmm. um, so I'd say uh, Come Again, which was a graphic novel that came out in 2018, has a lot of themes, but I feel like where it relates to this sense of like altered realities and a non-consensus take within the story on, uh, on the reality that's being experienced, um, a lot of it has to do with the theme of casualness in the face of an obvious crisis. Uh, I also like small settings for stories, so any kind of limit, like I love 12 Angry Men and Alfred Hitchcock's Rope. Anything that happens just in a building or just a room is my jam. Uh, so placing something in a limited setting, like a tiny hippie village on the top of a mountain, is very much my jam. Um, most of these books are threaded together by uh, a character who uh, is driven by the need to be believed to be taken seriously by this sort of drive for dignity and sovereignty. Uh, and my newest book, Fall Through, uh, really, like, I describe it as, like, a 1990s punk interdimensional soap opera. So it's basically like X-Men with less powers, still with some magic, but with, you know, like, loud, loud music involved as well. Uh, this blends, like, a lot of my own life and, and my involvement with this subculture, but uh, I feel like it was a, a bit of a step forward as a writer, uh, so that I realized by starting with what I wanted to draw, what I wanted to see and experience in the pages, I was recognizing that there would be gaps, things I didn't know. And so I would lean into the fact where I'd be like, okay, there's a paradox here I need to work out. And I'm like, wait, the paradox is part of the story. So I would kind of reverse engineer parts of this story, and eventually that turned into the plot that strung these different scenes together. Uh, it was very exciting, and like I was kind of feeling my way as I went, um, and I'm just very satisfied uh, with how it turned out and a chance to actually kind of talk about it a bit. Thanks. Uh, my name is Peter Cooper, and I'm a comic book addict. Um, I haven't read a comic book for... Um, about two minutes, I think. <laughs> <laughs> um, uh, I'm a li lifelong uh, comic fan, um, and uh, going back to doing fanzines when I was 11, and and just uh, hovering around comic conventions and things like that, and uh, seeing and meeting artists, it gave me the opportunity to imagine that as a career, which was um, I'm ever grateful for. And um, is it possible that we can show images? I, I mean, I, if you don't mind jumping ahead, just to change it up a little bit oh, here. Oh, we so can change it up a little bit, but we're gonna have to. I have, I have some questions. I'm sure you do, do, but I mean, if we yeah. could go to to, to a can. bunch of slides and then um, and then we'll come back I, later, I have, yeah, just so you I have, can see some images, because yes. I, I I'm a fan of looking at yes. art. So um, if you just can. 
click forward. Okay. Some. This is actually like the everyone's, so like Got this it. has like just a few. You'd have to go. D -d 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 -d. Yeah. If I'm just no, this is just really just complicated. A few. Yes. So uh, you know, it, it, I mean, with the subject of this panel, it feels like almost everything connects with that because so much of what we're doing is it ends up being that in one way or another. Um, that's from Metamorphosis. I did an adaptation of Kafka, and then uh, I have another book, uh, Kafka Ask. Also. Um, <clears throat> I, uh, uh, I think you know, dreaming has been uh, an influence on, on the comics that I do. Um, uh, LSD probably has too, <laughs> um, if I'm honest about it. Uh, that, um, and underground comics and seeing these things. And the way all the different things that you can do with comics that goes down all these different avenues. And um, you know, there's really sort of nothing you can't do in the form and um, the surreal aspect of it, the way you can have things seem natural and tell a story like in, in my current project, it's a history of insects and the people who study them. Um, there's ghosts in there and the insects are talking and, um, and at the same time, I feel like I'm t it's nonfiction. <laughs> um, so uh, yeah, so there, there's, there's so many different ways that that has come up in my work and I also really love the language of comics, um, so using comics without words to be a, uh, a way of communicating with people around the world. Uh, I do a weekly comic for Charlie Hebdo, a French magazine, and I don't speak French, so um, it's a wordless four-panel comic on the environment, and um, and I and it's very mostly surreal. I, I kind of try to have that be a little little poetic uh, story on very serious topics. So. Wonderful. Mm -hmm. Yes, and then anyway, you'll see more of that yes, later. Yes, a lot, a lot more. And this is that was really great because I have a, a different but similar first question now because of this. So it's wonderful. Um, let me go back a little bit. Um, okay, let me go back first because I'm just to make sure. Um, Christy. Oh, okay. Hi, y'all. Um, my name's Christy Furness. I'm an oil painter turned graphic novelist. This is my debut uh, graphic novel, Crazy Like a Fox, Adventures in Schizophrenia. Um, so I think the title is why I was invited <laughs> to this <laughs> panel. Um, but I uh, worked a lot talking about my story to the public um, about my experience with schizophrenia and I got the response I got from people um, kind of influenced me to think about writing it down. I have a lot of friends that are writers and I thought, you know, I'm not that great of a writer. I'm more of a storyteller and I see and I think visually. So I thought, oh, for sure, I'll draw this out. And I came up with this book years later, took years. Um, but the, uh, the story of Fox, and it's drawn, drawn with critters and, and creatures, uh, is experiences that I've gone through uh, throughout my life and through the mental health care system and stuff like that. So, but um, it is surreal in that, um, you know, I'm not drawing people walking through. I'm not, you know, and when, when um, Fox is having uh, symptoms, the, the whole atmosphere kind of changes. Um, uh, my oil paintings are much different. I use uh, thick, colorful brush strokes. Um, it's more expressionistic, um, figurative. Um, Occasionally, someone will throw me a pet portrait to keep my finances going. Um, but uh, but this is very simple line drawings. I um, I probably before I draw a line, I decide is this line gonna mean anything to the story and stuff. So it's it's very boiled down uh, way to look at it, and it's actually it's um, it's also humorous. I use humor in the story because it's, you know, it's, it, it helps to, when you have a chronic illness, to use humor. Mm -hmm. um, 
in your life. So I thought it would be a useful tool. That's how I tell stories, as I use, use humor. So um, what else do you need to know about me? I, I have been an artist for my entire adult life. I um, got out of high school, had a, a, uh, a, a scholarship. Uh, for art and then schizophrenia. So, uh, yeah, I went mostly to school hard knocks, but I did have a semester where I learned how to draw mm -hmm. um, and then just kept on going from there, mostly self taught in all of the mediums I do. So, there you go. Well, thank you. Yeah. Yes. Um, and also because this is often something that someone squeezes in at the end and there's always more questions and we're going to have time for questions at the end but even more questions after um, are always asked. The thing that I wanted everyone to make sure that they knew is that this is where all of these panelists are right after and I believe these are all the, and, and I believe that everybody except for Nate right after is doing a signing. Um, and so if you want to go and interact with them, I highly encourage it and also pick up their books. Um, and I'll put this up at the end as well, but I realize that often that gets squeezed at the very last second and people don't get to see it. Um, I have a first question question about this. This was an interesting panel to ask to moderate because as you've heard from these wonderful introductions, everyone works incredibly different and has incredibly different subject matters and um, interests, yet I'm asking, I was like, how am I going to do this? How, what kinds of questions am I going to ask this like wonderful group of people? Um, this idea of reality then um, and the way in which reality in comics can, can, reality in comics can kind of break the boundaries of like things like time and space and even logic. Um, I wanted to know like what is within your work, what is like altered in your reality? Um, like how is that represented in the works that you want to talk about today? I'll jump in to get things going. Uh, in Fall Through in particular, uh, the, the protagonist and narrator is uh, this character down here, Jody, bass player of this band, Diamond Mine. Um, and uh, basically, the, the sense of, like, of an altered reality is centered around like this, this uh, tour of a band in a van, a small underground punk band, that uh, basically, from their subjective vantage point, uh, every day, every evening appears to be a regular tour. However, there's a cumulative awareness that time has ceased to flow in a linear way. And so essentially this is where like, you know, a month long tour clearly has gone on for six months or longer. Uh, yet, you know, a lot of this is like a really kind of like accessible way to think about quantum spaces, way to think about bubble universes and the way that time appears to function differently from different vantage points. Um, so for, for a more expanded view of this, like try Michio Kaku's hyperspace. Uh, it's a great like entry point, but it's the idea that, uh, that everything appears, like you know, everything seems normal within the subjective confines of like, for example, being in a van in our world when you're on tour with your band family, uh, you sort of forget, you lose an awareness of everything that is connected to your life outside of that. And so a lot of the quantum issues, particularly losing touch with the thread of space-time, uh, becomes related to these themes of like, when we start to fall out of touch with our creative network, or we have more pressing issues at home, when people have different demands, priorities, visions for something that you've built as a, as a collective creation, like a band, um, and uh, basically, it's it's then becomes a mission to sort of uh, to break the curse, which has has kept them within these like hopping through these different little uh, bubble universes, so that they can actually get back home to their lives. Um, and uh, this is really like it's where the feelings come in. Like all of this is just kind of like this is like this is where writing becomes like a way to talk about what you want to talk about. So it was a lot of fun to figure out how established scientific theories and ideas could be fudged 
uh, in the service of a graphic novel. And what's fun about comics, as I think we all know, is you can do these hundred million dollar movie ideas, you know, with a hundred dollars worth of paper and pens, you know. So it just you just have to take a couple of years to make it happen. Uh, but it, yeah, it is the kind of thing where I'm like, okay, yeah, this would definitely be a hundred million dollar idea. Thankfully. Uh, you know, it's just a matter of like laying out these ideas, but also laying out what, you know, like a lot of the focus of the book is like when you're in the middle of something like this as it's happening, you don't notice what doesn't add up. Uh, so I think that might be the, the thing that holds it all together. <clears throat> yeah, um, what you say, and comics are, has the ability to stop time that is something that you can't do when while you are watching a movie uh, where you are, well, when you are reading a book, you can't stop time, but it, you don't normally do that. You like to read and you like to, to see in the next chapter. So comics has this uh, ability to, to stop time and you can try to create a big universe in a book that is only, uh, um, you know, is only possible with comics because if you want to create a movie or if you want to create you know, music or something, you need a lot more of people uh, to get involved on this. But for creating comics, it's your mind and it's your own concept of life. And about the question you have, uh, how is alterity or reality? Well, what is reality starting for that? Uh, it's one of, if one of the people that is here uh, has their own reality. I have my own reality, I'm speaking to us, uh, you have your own reality, but even more, you are thinking about things you have done in, your, in, in this moment, you are thinking in that moment, you are thinking the, th the, the things you are gonna do after this, so each one has a lot of realities inside, mm -hmm. so it's very, you know, it's sometimes we don't stop to think about that, that we don't have a reality. We live in a lot of realities at the same time, but we get used to do that from childhood. For that reason, you know, kids are very stressful, very, you know, they have to get used to be in a body, <laughs> in a body, in a reality, in a language, in a lot of things, no? You just born and you have a lot of things that make your reality. That is not here the same that India or in Afghanistan or in Spain. So about my work, um, my voice, I found that I like to, to try to understand human psychology and human emotions, what is fear, what is a uh, dream, what is um, unconsciousness, um, so yeah, I like to focus on characters that are placed in a, not in a particular place, just in a place that is very symbolic, uh, it's a metaphor of a place. So for that reason, I think people get very uh, close to that characters because they are not characters for a determinate place. Uh, I try to put a lot of different scenarios from America, from Spain, from other places, dreams, metaphors. So yeah, uh, escaping the reality makes a new reality. And that's the reason people like to draw and people like to tell the stories. So I think that's my point. Yes, well, thank you, yeah. Um, okay, my next question is a little bit um, because it's a little bit different, mostly because while I was looking at everyone's work and trying to like figure out what kinds of commonalities, I was struck by all of a sudden, I was like, all of you engage so much into the natural world, particularly with either representations of animals or, and I'm also including, I know, don't, don't come at me, science people. I'm including insects. I know insects are not animals, but yeah, um, animals. all of these, yeah. yeah. But like the insects are, yeah, insects are like, you know, um, yeah. And so I was wondering if you all would talk a little bit more about like this, why are, um, 
Like, why does the natural world figure so much in your realities, or what is, what has like encouraged you or um, made you want to have these animals either present as actual animals in the story or um, as metaphorical symbolism? Yeah, or both in a lot of cases. Okay. Um, for me, uh, since uh, it, it, it's an autobiographical story, but you know the main character is a fox, not not me. I, for I would be sick of drawing me for 240 pages, but um, I uh, also did it for um, to have distance from uh, from me to the story, and um, I became attached to my character uh, because uh, there were things that Fox was gonna go through, the Fox was gonna experience, and um, there are things that I omitted because I didn't want Fox to have to go through that. I felt too emotional towards Fox. But um, I, I put the different characters in there because um, it distances from me, but it also gives people the opportunity to put themselves in there. They're, they're, I don't really gender many of the characters, so it doesn't matter how you identify. You can kind of slide into whoever uh, fits for you. And um, But it also, it's very sparse, in the, you know, um, and I kind of did that because um, People are like, well, you should have a sense of place. You should have a sense of, you know, surroundings. And I'm like, does it make you feel a little crazy? You know, I just, I, I wanted that crazy making of it too. So, um, so um, it's, it's uh, the animals were for my own sanity and to make people feel a little insane while they could relate. <laughs> Does that make sense, sort of? Yes. Yes. Right. yes, I think it all makes sense. Um, when I was four, the uh, cicadas, the 17-year locust, as they sometimes are called, uh, came out. Um, that was in New Jersey, and they, it was one of the ground zeros for that. And the trees were covered with cicadas, and a lot of people I know like run screaming from that <coughs> and you know, are horrified by insects. And for me, I, was, I wanted to hug the tree. It, it was... It, it, it had the marvel of um, what later took my interest, which was comics. And looking at an insect and seeing, looking into how they operate and the idea that in the case of the cicada, they're underground a lot, awake for 17 years and, and we don't know exactly why they know to come out together at the same time. Um, so it, there's like these true miracle mystery things that going on, at, which I think is what I'm drawn to in storytelling, fantasy sto storytelling. Um, I was thinking I wanted to be an entomologist until you know, I saw Spider-Man or oh, Thor, yeah. um, and then then that kind of derailed that, and and now I'm sort of bringing myself back with the Venn diagram, which is something I recommend to. Uh, as, as a teacher, I recommend to students is like find that thing. You know, if you love comics, that's f great. But then, what else do you love, and and where you those those things can cross over. And for me, insects it was ideal for that uh, because the you know th there are these stories like the monarch migration from Canada to Mexico, and it was only in 1975 that that. North Americans discovered where they were. The, the people in Mexico knew where they were landing, but they go by the millions. And I went and visited that location where you're literally standing there. If you look on the ground, it looks like a river of shadows of, of monarch butterflies flying over head. And as my wife pointed out, um, this is amazing, but I'm really glad it's not cockroaches or flying <laughs> monkeys. <laughs> Or palmetto um, bugs. <laughs> uh, yeah, or, yeah uh, cockroaches. Uh, and um, so, you know, there, that, that, that incredible quality uh, in the natural world that's, that's like you're experiencing a, a fantasy um, I, dovetailed beautifully for, for the kind of comic story I wanted to tell. I just want to say the phrase river of shadows yeah. is so evocative yeah. and yeah. profound. I, got, I actually got goosebumps when yeah. you yeah. visualizing the 
butterflies. Good, yeah. good. Mm. Well done, Cooper. <laughs> uh, for me, I think uh, the relationship of the natural world, like to me, it was like as soon as I saw my first Hayao Miyazaki cartoon, mm -hmm. uh, all of a sudden, and this is where like being an American kid, reading American comics, like in the early 90s when I was first exposed to Japanese comics and cartoons as like a pre-internet Arkansas kid, all of a sudden, not only different storytelling styles, but the way that animism, uh, you know, as a cultural and societal element, integrates itself into visual art. It was profound to see all of a sudden, like, oh, here is a still shot of just treetops blowing for 20 seconds. And, I'll, you know, like my 14 year old self is, is like, why is water coming out of my eyes? <laughs> Um, and, the, you know, that made a big impact on me. Uh, for me, a lot of the, that then connects to sense memory. And uh, I feel like that's probably the aesthetic thread that connects the natural world through a lot of my books is, uh, like, I'm, I'm a southern child. I've lived in the Midwest for 20 years, but I've accepted and embraced that my, my fiction work in particular, but all my comics are how I maintain my connection with my home state of Arkansas, and with, you know, like my parents' generation, and, and also growing up in Alabama and Mississippi. And so a lot of that has to do with the way that soil looks and smells and feels, the kinds of flora and fauna, the way that grass looks on the side of the road, the kinds of trees that grow and where they stop growing. Um, and so for me, a lot of this is like, it's a lucky connection when it, when it, when it links with something else in the book, but for me, it's just it's more of a personal thing that's that's necessary as I grow older and older to like keep uh, representing the natural world from which I came in the American South throughout my work. Thank you. Yeah, yeah, it works. yeah I like that. It's like a little like a, maybe a foothold of a certain kind of personal reality. Yeah. Um, yeah, that leads me to my next question. Um, truth and facts are often contested. Uh, how important is the truth, or maybe like maybe another way of asking this is, how do you approach representing what you consider the truth in your own reality, be it like the narrative reality or like a memoir reality? Um, I, I think one of the beautiful things about art is that it really can show some truth, and that um, even if it's you know your personal truth, but uh, especially now I feel a great weight about trying to distinguish what's real uh, and what's what's fact from uh, what's fiction because everything has been turned very much upside down with the current political environment where we're literally disagreeing on what we're looking at. You know, I mean, I saw this let's say debate and then and it like when I'm like wow that you know she did great and then then the other guy comes out and says I won and you're like this is completely nutty <laughs> and and so one of the things that I think that that we can do with art is uh, show the emperor without clothes uh, if that's what you see and some and demonstrate certain things and again it's it's still it's it's my my telling of, of what I'm seeing, but, uh, but I think that there can be a lot of connective tissue with other people that are like kind of going, phew, I, I've been looking at that, and there's that almost that zeitgeist aspect to it, which I find, like I really feel, uh, you know, sometimes it's just the vibration of things. I feel like what's going on in the world here, and I'm trying to codify that through a drawing, and then, you know, one of the things that's great with the internet is if you put something out and you get, it, it is a way for us to communicate um, that will, that hopefully, you know, if you're feeling like you're losing your mind and like I saw something and is anybody else seeing this, that, that you know, one role I feel like I, I can personally play is going, this is what I saw. And then if other people have that same reaction and then it's like, Phew, okay, you know, I'm not going crazy, say. I, I wanted to say that, um, yeah, that I take meds so I can communicate crazy to the rest of the world. So, um, so the, the, 
the concept of truth is, you know, like Laura was saying earlier, is is your perception um, agreed upon truth? Um, I had to um, kind of make my drawings uh, more understandable, which, yeah, I mean, you know, you see Fox is upside down. Uh, that's a feeling. And, you know, I'm conveying feelings with imagery. And um, with Laura's work, you, you see, um, you know, it's this beautiful illustration, but you are in the desert, you know, with her characters. And um, in uh, Nate's book, The Swallow, Swallow, Swallow Me Hole, Hole. Mm -hmm. Um, yeah, like uh, creatures in jars come to life and everything, and it's um, it's these things that I, when I first was asked to be on this panel, I'm like, I'm going to be explaining altered realities visually to a bunch of comics artists, you know, I was just <laughs> like, that's everybody's, that's what we're all doing, right? <laughs> everybody's conveying different realities, and so, um, but I think um, the, the truth comes in how um, people receive it, right? Because, like, you, you probably don't think Fox is actually upside down. You think Fox is feeling upside down, right? Or did you really think Fox is upside down? I don't know. Um, but um, so the truth is... Um, is that um, that agreed upon part, you know, that perception that, can you read this, does this make sense, do you understand what's going on here, or do you not, because that's not what, I don't want you to understand what's going on here yet, you know, and um, yeah, it, it took a long time to get to a point to be able to work sequentially, um, uh, but, Usually, I'm conveying a feeling in in two dimensional work, um, like. Um, but two dimensional work is an illusion anyway. I like yeah. Oh, this is I like that. Um, just mentioning that the truth is this agreed upon part because it makes me reflected back on like looking at Laura's work when I was preparing for this panel. I bought a book not realizing it was in Spanish. Um, a language I do not read. Uh, <laughs> but I still went through and looked at it, and because it is words and images, I was like, I understand this without having to put it through a Google Translate because of the way that um, there's so there's a lot of like beautiful silent moments that are the part part of it, and so that was like actually a really great experience. Um, I could probably tell you a lot more about it in a way that um, made me really like appreciative of having that not knowing the language, um, and so it made me think about um, like what the um, what the relationship is between, because you all are making things that are ideally like pe people are gonna buy them and read them. So what the relationship between this reality is that you're constructing is with an audience. Like how does that affect what you, um, does it affect what you make? Do you think about that? Or how does it um, like in, maybe inform this reality? Or perhaps change? Um with the audience, because I was thinking, I am still thinking in the other question, sorry. Oh, sure. <laughs> I'm, yeah, I'm still thinking in the other question, and I will mix with this one. Oh, sure. Uh, because the, the true, how important is, is the true for mm -hmm. us? Um, yes. And for me, my true is not important, because it's, uh, it's just mine. And mm -hmm. for me, it's more important to try to understand other people's truths, because they have their own you know, they, they own journey. So for me, it's very important to feel that I'm growing, trying to understand other people's realities and other people's truths. And my true that I have now that is not important to me is not the true I had like 10 years ago. And I hope it's not the same that I will be in 10 years uh, for, for now. And so I think one of the, the best things we can do making art 
even if you like to make comics or maybe if you are in front of a Rothko or watching a David Lynch movie, it's not trying to not trying to keep that true, like trying to understand what is happening there. Because uh, actually, we don't really know what, if, if life makes any sense at all, like what is life and mm -hmm. what is uh, the, the sense of the reality here. So if you go to a museum in front of a Rothko with three big uh, colors in front of you, and you try to make sense of this, like what does it mean? I think we don't have to try to understand things very deeply. Just try to feel that mm -hmm. and to move on and to try to keep that as a, as a journey, as a, a learning thing. So my truth for me is not important. I just try to um, show emotions in the comics so people can feel close to that. Like you are not alone, you feel very close to that. For that reason, we like music, because music is a universal feeling that goes directly to, uh, um, to, your, to your mind and to your soul. So yes, um, the last question was about the oh, emotion. Oh yeah, I was asking about, I would see, yeah, sorry I jumped ahead, I was just like excited, because now, now I'm thinking about it, I was like, yeah, it's a little bit like re looking at your comic like that. It was like, it was like listening to music that was just happened to be in a language I didn't understand, <laughs> but I was yeah. like, I could simply like, this is beautiful, I get the feeling of it, I don't need mm -hmm. to know what the words actually say. And so that was like a great experience. But yeah, my question was in for everybody. Um, how does having like the audience of like re or the reader um, impact maybe the reality that is like presented or the reality of like comics for you? Mm -hmm. So uh, I can keep. Oh yes. <laughs> yeah, um, everyone has their own f uh, filters of you know culture filters, uh, emotional filters. So everyone is gonna read, is gonna accept this uh, book or the story in a different ways. So everything, you know, is uh, accepted. So I don't know, when someone get the book, uh, it's up to them to understand, to just like or not. I would just throw in a, a quick response, which is uh, when I think about doing, uh, I, picking a, a book to do, um, I realize I really only have an audience of one, which is me. And so I better like what I'm doing, mm -hmm. um, especially the sustain on doing a project. Um, but I, I feel th I'm pretty vague on who the audience f for my work is. And I know that it's also changing depending on the project. And so I, I, uh, I think about wanting people to respond to it and, and like what's going on. Or mm -hmm. maybe I have a message in mind, like with Insectopolis. I, I, I want it, it's for the audience of people who love insects, but I also hope it's for the audience of people who don't love them mm -hmm. and who will maybe change their mind and not want to stomp on everything they see and have a, a different appreciation. I, uh, <clears throat> I guess connecting, uh, connecting what Laura said and what Christy said during that last answer uh, to this one, uh, I think that particularly as we're talking about this sort of non-consensus view of the universe that's within a story, I've discovered increasingly book from like Swallow Me Hold Any Empire to Come Again to Fall Through that the notion of mystery as being an enduring thing that is un that where like something is fundamentally still unresolved by the end of a story is actually a challenge. Uh, two readers uh, and four readers. And uh, for me, it's just like, it's, it's the way I instinctively want to do a story. And so I have to work to kind of like ground it and like, you know, give it some meat and potatoes. But I have discovered that, you know, like, and I've had to like really accept that sometimes, particularly with fall through, uh, readers get irritated by that challenge sometime. And I have to accept that there's a cross section of readers uh, that like, that struggle to accept the still unexplained, like people like mystery as a ride, 
oftentimes people like to get off the ride at the end to be like, oh, here's what actually happened. Mm -hmm. uh, and the whole thing about the four graphic novels I've done is that to different degrees, I refuse the basis of that, that there is an objective reveal. Uh, and you know, in some ways, that's kind of a cop out because it's like, well, what do you think happened? But that's also kind of <laughs> cool. We all know this. That's fun too. But uh, for example, I found that uh, for me, I actually thought that like the the sort of wormhole quantum situation that's happening with this band and fall through works pretty squarely and pretty well. But I discovered that people are sometimes readers are going to hold on to whatever they can hold on to. And the fact that there's this time jump with our protagonist, Jody, who basically is a teenager in early 1978, and inexplicably, uh, we, are, we are thrown into this world of the early mid-90s where she is very explicit that she doesn't quite understand how the past connects to the present mm -hmm. and, and is sort of living through a fog. But uh, this is like, this is why you don't read reviews or whatever. <laughs> But, you know, like, they're helpful sometimes. And you're like, oh, pe some people get really hung up on, be like, oh, well, I think most of this story takes place around 78 to 79, because this, and, but they're holding on to, like, this musical thread of, like, what was happening between the first and second waves of punk. And I'm like, oh, man, you guys are getting really off the track here. I'd be like, it, it's okay to not know. In fact, like, part of our narrator's, captions are, are basically like, it's all about not knowing what you don't know and then discovering that you just don't have answers for some things. Uh, but I mean, it's just, it's a fundamental challenge, I think. And whether or not I succeeded or not, I don't, I don't really care because I like <laughs> the book I made. But yeah, like, you know, people process vagueness in a different way and it irritates people sometimes. <laughs> And it's like, yeah, maybe that's what was going on in that place where there's a wormhole also. Like maybe the timeline of music was a little bit different. Um, before we open it up to, this has gone by very quickly, which is a good sign, but also it makes me anxious that we haven't. I wanted to make sure, are there questions that the panelists have for each other um, at all about anything, big or small? <laughs> um, yeah, oh, you have one here. I have a quick question for Laura. So you're from Spain. Yeah. And as you were saying, a lot of the, like in terms of setting, you know, you have things that are happening in vague locations, but also, you know, like there are, there are visual touchstones that indicate a sense of space. Um, so as we've already talked about the way that the desert uh, and rocky, arid terrain plays in, in, your, in your stories, um, you know, I as far as the American Southwest, the American desert, and the Mexican desert, I feel like a lot of visual themes uh, work in terms of like, in terms of death, time, mm -hmm. scarcity. And for me, as an American reader, you know, like I, I really get into the horror element because of the desert setting. And this is just an ignorant question as far as the the role that the desert plays in Spanish culture with visual symbols for death, time, age, scarcity. Mm -hmm. um, is there a, is, are there specific similarities or differences that you're playing into with the role of the desert? N not exactly, because even I, I grow up in Spain, uh, yeah, I, I have this cultural uh, growing up in Spain, but I really focus in a lot of cultures uh, from childhood. I really like to, to explore other cultures. So even I'm in, in Valencia in Spain, I've been traveling a lot around the world and I'm so interested in other cultures and more for death, how they are from death and loneliness and you know uh, the deep meanings of the human psychology. So I've been in Nevada, I've been in a lot of places here in America and I found very scary like this big desert, desert in like how many dead bodies are around here? <laughs> yeah, I'm sure people keep people and left there. I was in the car and I was like, oh my God, 300 kilometers with no, that makes me feel very scared, but I like being scary. But for that reason, I like making comics because uh, I really like 
uh, scary things, like uh, not as scary in the way, but yeah, wondering things. So I just try to to put in comics what I feel uh, while traveling, while because I don't even if I'm from Spain, I don't feel like in a place uh, mm -hmm. because I've been living in a lot of places. So. Yeah, for that reason, I put a lot of different scenarios in the same comic. Um, yeah, um, deserts and these kind of big places make me feel a lot of things that I try to focus and put in drawings. Um, thank you. Thank you. A, yeah, I would, I would love to see um, some of the illustrations. You mentioned Rothko, like an illustration out of your book, Rothko Size. Yes. Yeah, that would, I would just, yeah, <laughs> that'd be cool. I love Rothko. He was, uh, well, I kind of, you know, feeling so sad very often, and I like the feeling, no? Uh, it's very universal, these this paintings. I think they are awesome, yeah. Yes, okay, so we have um, some time for some questions. There are microphones, I think, I believe, on either side, so if anyone has any questions, please line up, and we can take a few. Hi. Um, so I'm also an author illustrator who writes a lot about my personal experience with mental illness. And I sometimes feel a pressure to be good representations. And I wonder if you guys feel any similar types of anxieties and how you push past it. Um, yes. <laughs> uh, yeah, I... Um, after I did the mini comic leading up to this, it was years ago, I was asked to speak at a college um, classroom about, well, t twice. One to a comics, uh, an art class, and secondly to a psychology class. And someone asked me a similar question, you know, how do you like being a schizophrenic poster child? And I'm like, oh. <laughs> It's hard, yeah, it's hard. Um, but it's, um, you know, I, where I find it hard is not in the comics, not, I'm, you know, I tell the experiences, you know, I, uh, my comics are, are not violent. There's like a reference to sex noise, but there's no graph, there's nothing in there that's, really scary, um, I think. I mean, a suicide attempt, whatever. But, um, but for me, to put uh, myself out there, you know, when I'm having symptoms, I'm not wanting to come talk on a panel. I'm not having symptoms right now. I'm really well medicated right now. And I'm feeling great, and I feel like I'm in a friendly atmosphere, I, you know. But um, most of my symptoms happen late and at home, so I'm able to just hide, you know. And I don't want to show that part. I don't want to show that part. But also, I do want to talk about it because that's, you know, because it's real. You know, that's, I mean, that's the reality of mental health is, yeah, we're human. Um, when I worked um, at a drop-in center for adults with persistent and severe mental illness, um, you know, people, we, it was a very busy part of Minneapolis. It's very, you know, and a lot of people would come in off the street and you'd have to be a member, so you'd have to qualify to get in anyway. So, but there were so many, such, everyone is completely different, and that's what everyone should understand and what you should um, convey to people, I think, is that all of us as subsets of humans are just human. Like, we all have our faults. You know, some people rage, some people cry. You know, it's, it's, um, being a poster child is also showing that humanity and being vulnerable and being able to hide and just pet your cat when you can't deal, you know? 
I just, that's, that's where I'm coming at. Did I answer your question a little bit? Yes, absolutely, thank you. Okay. Okay, um, and then to my right. Um, I was actually wondering, when you're like depicting these different realities, um, how would you say are the difficulties in like normalizing um, some of these different experiences for people, or do you try to avoid normalizing it? Is that for one person in particular? Oh, no, it's more situation. of a general question. Yeah. I, I'd say this is where I've I've come to kind of embrace the way that making the comic itself, like the fact that we have choices with line, texture, panel borders, gutters, negative space, color, like for me, this is where, uh, like now that my comics are increasingly becoming closer to full color, I've realized that developing an internal color coding system, because uh, I have a lot of transitions in my, my novels, whether it's internal or external narratives, past or present, different threads of you know, continuity. Uh, and so I try to find the simplest, most accessible way to kind of differentiate that doesn't interrupt the story, but that also maybe gives a little wiggle room. And for me, it's simply shifting my color palette a little bit. And sometimes I'll drop out color completely for a moment. Like, so it's, it's basically like, it's leading the horse to water, but it's not making it necessary to drink the water in order to, uh, to get whatever out of the story. Um, so yeah, for me, like the fun of reading a book, you know, like when I'm making stories, I try to think about like what I love watching in a movie, what I love reading in someone else's comic, and the fact that like I love putting a little effort in and not understanding exactly where the creator's coming from. Um, you know, we always talk about like a contract with the reader, but it's real, you know, like, uh, and so it's, it's nice not to take it all the way to the finish line. But yeah, for me, in a practical sense, shifting my color palette is the easiest way to like lay it out but not be super explicit. Yeah, I mean, I really love, I mean, it's one of the great things that comics can do. You can move in and out of uh, reality or, or say this is gonna be the reality, like say, something like in Mouse where Art Spiegelman says, yeah, they're all gonna have mice heads but we know those, those are people and you accept it completely. And there's just, the way, you know, it's, it's a, a remarkable form that way because you can do that and you can uh, visually, uh, it's, it's in movies they call it a form cut where you go from you know like a, 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 a screaming mouth to a, a tunnel or something like that. That you can do all this, you can do these narrative shifts and, and um, make these kinds of leaps or just tell the audience we're now going into this altered reality. And if you if you're sufficiently hand holding or you know get people to make that leap, then you can do pretty much anything. And it's it's a you know, I, and color is definitely one of the things. I mean, I do a lot of drain the color out or just like in this situation where I have the, this butterfly flying into the room, there's no color at all the, except for the butterfly because they're saying, I'm, I'm feeling lost. And that that's not, I don't think a reader's gonna go, where's the color? They're just gonna get the emotional impact of that. And, and there's, you know, it's, it's kind of bottomless. I mean, one of the reasons I teach is because I need to remind myself of all the things you can do with comics. And so uh, while talking about it, I'm going, oh yeah, 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 I gotta do that. And there's that thing, and then where somebody, you know, a student does it, and then I go, I'm gonna steal that from that student. <laughs> <laughs> okay, this is wonderful. My apologies, we actually are at time. Um, but like I said, all of these um, cartoonists will be at their tables. I'm actually um, a K1, by the way. I know I look like a K9, K1. I'm oh, sorry K1. about that, Peter. Yeah, K1. Um, and please go and talk, say hi and buy their books. Thank you all very much, and thank you, panelists. Thank you.